Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, ciao, bonjour, namaste, jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hey, my name is Jed Lee. Welcome to Reading with Your Kids. We're coming to you from the beautiful, wonderful, historical neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so honored and so very delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. We do that by sharing fun, thoughtful, and thought-provoking conversations with fascinating people who just happen to be writing books for kids of all ages. And boy, do we have some fascinating conversations for you today. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Let them know that they can hear us on the WREB AM FM 24-7 radio network. And they can find us on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podcast Attic, Amazon Music, Audible, CastBox, Player FM, wherever you find your podcast. I can't wait to introduce you to our guest today. First up, it's New York Times best-selling author, two-time Newbery honoree, Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. She'll be here to celebrate the night war. And later on in the show, we'll meet Deborah Friedman. She'll be celebrating Partly Cloudy. Hey, are you ready to ignite a passion for reading in your students? Introducing BookAndAuthor.com, your gateway to literacy connections. With BookAndAuthor.com, connecting your school with talented authors of captivating kids' books has never been easier. Simply visit our user-friendly website and explore our extensive database of authors. Filter your search based on budget, genre, and availability. Discover the perfect match for your school and your students. But that's not all. With BookAndAuthor.com, you have the power to request a proposal. Let vetted authors come to you with their tailored ideas, ensuring an unforgettable literacy experience for your students. Don't wait any longer to inspire young minds through the magic of books. Visit BookAndAuthor.com today and open the door to a world of literacy connections. BookAndAuthor.com, where literacy comes to life. Before we invite our guest in, I want to tell you about one of our side projects that we really love. It's called Drawing With Your Kids. If you're looking for a creative way to bond with your kids, you have to check out Drawing With Your Kids, the ultimate destination for artistic adventures. Join us as we dive into the wonderful world of children's books with renowned illustrators guiding you step by step. From beloved characters to whimsical scenes, unleash your imagination and create cherished memories together. Whether you're a seasoned artist or just picking up a pencil, there's something for everyone. Visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, and click on the Drawing With Your Kids link at the top of the page and let the creativity flow. Drawing With Your Kids, where every stroke brings stories to life. Join us right now from the great state of Tennessee. Our guest is a New York Times best-selling author, a two-time Newbery honoree, and she is the author of The Night War. Please welcome to the show, Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Kimberly, how are you? I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm I'm great, but I have a feeling uh, I'm going to be a little bummed out when we start talking about your book. Not because it's a bad book, but it's a difficult subject. <laughs> No, it's this is this is uh, this is a hopeful uh, Holocaust book as as much as that can be done. I think I, I was um, just <laughs> I've never heard those two words. Together. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, with good reason too. Sure. But mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, I I'm I'm writing for ten year olds, so I want to tell the truth, but I also don't want to traumatize them. Well, you know, that kind of brings up the first question. Um, um, not too long ago, I interviewed Anne Suk Wan, who uh, wrote a book, a um, picture book that was set in the Korean War. And now this is a middle grade novel talking about the Holocaust. And I guess the first question is, why would our kids benefit from reading about these really horrific moments in history? Well, um, I think the 
there's two reasons. And, um, but, but first of all, this is a book set during the Holocaust, and it does involve uh, the deportation of, of Jews and things, but it is not in a camp. Um, it is not it's not the the true horrors of what really happened. It doesn't take place in a ghetto or somewhere that um, you can't tell the truth without being pretty traumatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just read Steve Scheinkin's Impossible Escape, which is for uh, older teens. And it's a story of a man's escape from Auschwitz. And that's not something I would ha- hand to a 10 year old. I think it's completely brilliant. Uh, but I, this is, um, it's really important. I think for kids to know, um, that the Holocaust happened and, and to know um, the things that caused it to happen mm-hmm. and that lots of otherwise well-meaning people went along with things that they, that they shouldn't have and that that's part of uh, what caused so much misery and so much death and suffering. Um, and I think it's, it's actually very pertinent because there are uh things like that that happen here in the world today. And, um, you know, there's been a a big rise in anti-Semitism in the last couple of years. And uh, Jewish people are 2% of America's population, but they're 50% of the victims of of hate crimes. And, you know, you you sort of see people um, modeling things that they shouldn't be. One of the the quotes I like from this book uh, is is one of the nuns who's helping um, my main character escape from the roundup in Paris. Um, She says, one way to get power is to conquer your enemies. So the first thing to do is create an enemy. And I think that sometimes we see that uh, this group wants to hold the power. And so they they decide that they're all joined together to be against that group over there. when really that group over there is not causing any harm and is, is not, um, they, you know, they've just become a created enemy. They're not a true enemy. That is, I think a really powerful message and lesson for kids is this idea that it is so easy to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I, I think in one of the goals of, of the podcast is to, really encourage families to help our kids realize that we are all one part of one beautiful human family. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So let's talk about the story in night, the night war. Yeah. Uh, so it, it starts out in Paris, um, in the Jewish, uh, the, well, I say the Jewish neighborhood, it was, uh, where the immigrant Jews lived it was actually a long time ago where, where the Jews lived in Paris, like in the 1300s, um, and then was in different things at different times. But uh, in 1942, it was uh, home to a huge immigrant Jewish population, people that had come from other parts of Europe see- seeking safety, uh, Germany and Russia and um, Poland and things like that. So um, there were actually a, a lot of other places that were Jewish neighborhoods in Paris, but this was the immigrant place. It was mm-hmm. called the Pletzel. It's also called the Marais. Uh, it's kind of better known by that name because it's still, uh, it's right in the center of Paris and it's now kind of this hip trendy place while still retaining a lot of Jewish character. But uh, on July 16th and 17th of 1942, the French police rounded up um, all the Jews in Paris that they could find Um 13,152, the majority of whom are women and children, uh, because the Jewish populations had gotten enough of a tip-off that a lot of the men were in hiding because they thought they were going to be taken just for work camps, which had been happening uh, for the previous two years since the German occupation. But this wasn't work camps. This was part of uh, the annihilation scheme. And um, so all over Paris, but but especially the Pletzel uh, the Jewish people were taken by on Paris city buses by Paris police, not by Germans. It was a German order, but the, but the French did this. Uh, and most of the people they rounded up were actually French citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were taken to the Velodrome d'Hiver, which simply stands for Winter Stadium. So it's known to history as the Veldiv Roundup. Um, of those 13,000 people, over 4,000 were children. And of the people that 
that were held inside the velodrome, only six of those children are known to have survived the war. Um, so that's where we start um, with my with my Jewish uh, character Miri, who is um, originally German, but is has been living for the, in the Plutzel for quite a while and is fluent in French. Uh, and she escapes uh, from those buses before they enter the stadium, and eventually, with the help of some other people, finds herself in a small town called Chenonceau, uh, which is home to a famous castle called the Chateau de Chenonceau. It's it's a very beautiful castle. It was built um, over time, but but chiefly in the 1500s by Diane de Poitiers and Catherine de Medici. Um, and the thing that's interesting about the castle, one of the things that's interesting about it is it's actually a bridge over the river. It was built from an old mill house and it spans the river. So that the front door of the castle, you, you go over a little bridge and you go through the castle and out the back door over a little bridge and you're on the other side of the river. It's a very small river called the Cher, but it happened to be the dividing line between occupied France and Vichy France. And so during the time that there was a Vichy France uh, until November of 1942, the castle was actually being used as a way to shuttle people to safety because it was the only bridge over that river for several miles. And the Germans knew that it was the only bridge, and so they actually stationed um, soldiers there. And they had a gun trained on the castle, and they said they were going to blow it to pieces if they found hard evidence of, of people going through. So, Wow. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard to believe that this happened less than uh, 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we think of atrocities and we think of, you know, the ancient past, but... There are people who went through this that are that are still alive today. Yes. Yeah. Not as many as there used to be, mm -hmm. um, but absolutely there are. And um, yeah, so a lot of what this book is exploring is the difference between um, following the rules and doing what's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the French government has has said repeatedly and, and says it on plaques. Um, all over the Plutzel, where they're commemorating people who died, they said, you know, uh, these people were killed because they were born Jewish with the active complicity of the French government. Uh, and um, at that time, you know, we, all, we all know about the French resistance, but until November of 1942, when the Germans occupied the entirety of France, there wasn't much resistance because most French people were trying to say, well, we're not entirely occupied we still have this Vichy government. Uh, let's go along with these Germans, and they'll let us alone. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lot more um, just kind of quietly trying to keep your head down uh, until until November. Yeah. How can we best help our kids discern what's right to do in given situations? That's a really hard question. Um, I mean, I do think that uh, a lot of people have a religious faith and that doesn't um, sort of lead them to a certain, you know, the Ten Commandments or, or you love your neighbor as yourself or um, whatever the different kind of strictures would be. That that sort of love your neighbor as yourself is, is um, repeated through all sorts of other religions. Um, Islam and Hindu and, you know, all things. But um, but I don't think that that's what's required to be a good person and to figure out how to do what's right. Um, I think about the oath that physicians take, you know, do no harm. Uh, and, and I think that that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is just trying to realize how much alike we really are as different people. Um, and the more that you can expose kids to um, people that don't quite exactly look like them or quite exactly talk like them, um, don't live in the place where they live, the more that they're going to start realizing, I think, uh, our global humanity and then acting in a more humane way. Uh, that's the hope of it anyway. That's... Um, I have a nonprofit called Appalachian Literacy Initiative that gives books to low-income kids in Appalachia. And we make very sure that the selections we offer kids, they're choosing among the selections, but that it's a, a very diverse offering uh, because we're trying to say, 
you know, here's this book about a Muslim child who has trouble playing basketball and make worries he's not going to make the team. Just like you worry, you're not going to make the team. It's not, um, you know, there's no reason to make this person an enemy. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I think books are a wonderful tool that families can use to you know, be that window mm-hmm. into a different culture to see somebody who might speak a different language, have have very many different customs. We were fortunate living in a city like Boston with a lot of international students and whatnot. We, um, we, our family took part in, our family is also bicultural. And, uh, and so we really went out of our way to uh, open our homes to international students, to mm-hmm. do things with students from, from different countries and different cultures. Uh, not everybody lives in a place like Boston that, that has that many opportunities. So I think the books can be a good, um, I don't know if substitutes the word, but a good place for a lot of families to start. Yeah, it's at least a starting place because I, I do. I live in a rural area. It's um, more white than than the United States as a as a whole. Uh, we, we skew a little more white and, and definitely skew more Christian than a lot of uh, the places in the United States and, and just sort of isolated rural communities. I mean, these little towns around here where everybody has been the same for a long time. And I think that books are a way in, uh, you know, I was fortunate. I took my kids, uh, traveling all over, uh, and they got to experience things from a young age, but a lot of people can't do that. And so I, I really do think that, um, literature is an important way in. Yeah. And I think that that's something that, uh, the industry as a whole has done much better in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. We have a lot more perspectives than we used to. What was it that inspired somebody living in Appalachia to write this story? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one was, was visiting Shannon So, which I did in the spring of 2017. Um, and just really kind of being mesmerized. My children say I have um, a book face. They, they'll say, oh, no, look out. Mom's got her book face on. And <laughs> you know, when we're traveling somewhere where I'm starting to be able to think, you know, this would be a great place for a, a book. This would be a, you know, this and this and this would work. But you always need a bunch of ideas. And so um, the other important part of the night where actually I found at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust um, Museum in Jerusalem, uh, I was there and uh, was reading a, a couple of things that struck me. And one was um, sort of the, the institutionalized uh, hatred that, that led to World War II, uh, that led to Hitler being able to do what he did. Uh, and, but the other thing was there was a, um, um, a section on, on people that were on the other side. And, they had a uh, display about a bishop in Toulouse, which is actually a southern French town. It's not near Chenin, so, but uh, who had hired a Jewish couple. They were clandestinely Jewish as the superintendent of Catholic schools so that they could um, hide children temporarily in those schools and, and get them to safety. And it was the idea of a child being hidden in this Catholic school and then Chenin, so having historically been this path to freedom. Um, so I, I take my character from Paris to Chenin So, and now she is involved in getting people to safety, but also, you know, she needs to save herself. Um, so it was really those, those two places. When I, when I came out of Yad Vashem, I, I felt like I had what I needed for mm-hmm. a book. It still took me uh, a couple of years to get to writing it, but, um, but I felt like I knew the, I knew the problem. I knew what we wanted to write about. Yeah. When that book face comes comes to you, um, is it something that is intentional? Do you say, okay, I'm, I'm looking for ideas now and I got the book face on? Or is no. it just you're there, you see something, and it's like it just happens? Yeah, no, it, it much more just happens. I just I want to know all about the thing. That's when I start you know, asking Lots and lots and lots of questions to whatever tour guide we have. You know, the tour is now going to take twice as long as it was. <laughs> and um, my children have also, <laughs> they made a rule in middle school uh, because I would go on their field trips and they, that I was not allowed to ask 
any tour guide any question to which I already knew the answer um, <laughs> because I would start steering the conversation, you know, the direction I, I thought it should go. <laughs> So, um, yeah, no, this is just, I, I'm curious about all sorts of things. I mean, I, I just, um, there's so many things to, to learn about. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, my beautiful wife and I are, are going to be going on a, on a escorted tour of, uh, Scotland and Ireland. Oh, nice. And yeah. And I'm really looking forward to asking, those questions and not just sitting back in, you know, like I'm watching a movie being presented by uh, a, a, someone in, in, in person. Uh, right. It's, it, it really, it's a lot of fun. And I really think for the most part, if you have a good guide, I think they like it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And when I went to Israel, I actually was with a group of children's writers and illustrators. It was on a trip sponsored by PJ library and, uh, we had extraordinary experiences, but it was the, the first time I'd really been in a group of people who respond to things the same way I do. So everywhere we went, somebody would light up and start asking a million questions. And, you know, we were perpetually behind schedule just because everyone was so interested and engaged in, in the things we were learning. Yeah. And it was you know, terrific fun. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, Kimberly, that the Jewish people make up about 2% of the world's population. But here in the United States, they experience half of the reported hate crimes. Yes. Why? Do, and, and throughout history, um, the Jewish people have been persecuted, uh, not only by Hitler and the Nazis, but in, in various times throughout sure. history. Why do you think that might be? Actually, <laughs> this is a really uh, weird thing, but I think I am the reason for the historic um, is is actually more about money and power, which is than than anything to do with religion. Uh, if you go back to medieval times, Christian people were not allowed to, and and the Catholic Church at the time was the only Christian denomination. I'm talking before mm -hmm. the Protestant Revolution or whatever you call it. But um, so you had had this Christian church as a very important political thing. Well, um, and they were, most of the heads of, of Europe were Christian. Obviously you have the sultans in the, in the Near East and that sort of thing. But um, Christians were not allowed to loan money at interest. Mm. It was called usury and it was considered against the rules of the church. Jewish people didn't have that rule, but they were not allowed in most countries to own property which hmm. is the traditional way that um, you know, people would get land and then they would you know, develop wealth that way. And so what that meant was that the bankers became Jewish because you didn't need property and it wasn't against the law and people would need to borrow money. That's something that happens over and over. But here's the problem is that a king would borrow a bunch of money from the Jewish bankers in order to you know, go on crusade or go to war against somebody and then they wouldn't want to pay it back. Mm. So what do you do? You throw all the Jews out of your country and say it's because they're bad people. I've, you know, I've never heard that um, it makes, I was going to say it makes sense, but it really yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of horrifying because you think, you know, people would, because then, I mean, you know, the Catholic Church went about this whole, you know, they 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 really did say things like, um, you know, Jews murder children and drink their blood, which, I mean, was just, it was completely made up. Um, but it really comes back to, I don't want to have to pay them what I owe them. Mm -hmm. And they're a smaller group, so I can pick on them, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, um like that nun in your book said, uh, the one way to get power is to conquer your enemy, and the first thing yeah. to do is to create an enemy. Yeah, yeah. So I've just become more powerful. I don't have to pay my money, and these people can't do anything about it because there's there's too few of them, and you know I've got the the soldiers, and um, and so I mean that kind of happens. Like you you can see. I mean, even in France, I mean the the people that there's a um, Rue de Escoffier, uh, which is Moneylender Street, and it's from the 1300s because that's where the Jewish people lived. 
and then they got kicked out of France, and then they were allowed back in. I mean, it, it just, you know, if you look at the map of Europe and start, like, paying attention to this stuff, um, it's really much more about um, power and, and political power and injustice than anything else. It really has almost nothing to do with religion. Mm -hmm. Religion just gets used as this excuse. Yeah, yeah. What a horrific thing that, you know... Um, you know, a church that is built in, it's, it's not just the Catholic Church, but right. many religions and faiths that, that are built on uh, a message of love and acceptance and family and kinship uh, is is so oftentimes turned into um, hate. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you just, a couple of uh, hundred years of scapegoating people, you get very accustomed to the idea that, this is an acceptable scapegoat. Yeah. yeah. This is, so. How how did writing the Night War change you? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think. Um, I mean, I think I, I I like to think I was already on the side of um, justice, and I like to think that I already felt like there were good people of all sorts of faiths. I think I was a little bit, this was the hardest part for me, and this is something I will talk about. Um, there's a school in the Pletzel, a public school that Mary goes to. It's it's in the book. And um, her principal, although the roundup takes place in summer and school's out, her principal in the book is um, someone who warns people about the impending roundup. And that man was a real historical figure. He's the only one in the book. His name was Joseph Mignoret, and he was um, the principal of the French public school in the Pletzel. Um, he's considered one of the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem because uh, when the school started up again after this roundup, four children came to the school. That was all that were left. Oh. Uh, everyone else had been either deported or was in hiding. And uh, Joseph Mignoret spent the rest of the war saving as many kids as he could. But I went to um, the Shoah Museum in Paris, and I got a list of Jewish – they had a list – it's a book, really, of all of the kids who went from the Valdiv to Drancy, which was a French concentration camp, and from Drancy to Auschwitz. And it had – um, their addresses and their names and their ages. And if you look at the ages and the address, you could figure out who went to that school. And we put their names in the back of the book. Um, uh, it was, you, and it's, you know, I found this list of 160 kids, over half of whom had been born in Paris. Uh, and just typing out their name um, really made this real to me. I mean, they were, they were people. And you would see... Um, you know, siblings, um, Albert Zimmerman, Florette Zimmerman, Josette Zimmerman. Uh, and, and, and I was leaving off on the list, the ones that were too old and too young to go to the school. Uh, and on that list, there were things like, um, unnamed boy. And those were kids that were too young to say their names, but had been separated already from all of their family. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't, couldn't name them. And so this became, I don't know if it's right to use the word holy, maybe kind of sacred. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, these were real children. Um, uh, I've created a fictional one that I care about, but but the story becomes very important because of those names that we put in the back. Yeah. Um, because we, we want to remember that that happened and that, that there was nothing... There was no excuse for it. I mean, they were children, and we um, it still happens all over the world, and, and it's something we need to fight against. Yeah. Well, I, I think that The Night War is a pretty important book, and I think one that would be a powerful experience for a family to share together, for a parent and child to co-read, if not read aloud together, and, to, and, and I think will inspire many really important conversations. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Kimberly, where can people go to find out more about you and find out more about The Night War? Well, I have a website, uh, which is KimberlyBrewbakerBradley.com, so easy to remember. 
Uh, and that has information about me and a link if anybody wants to email me uh, and, and some information about my other books. Uh, the Night War is going to be released April 9th, and it should be um, really at, at most bookstores, I think, and, um, you know, yeah. online, I'll, wherever books are sold, let's say it that way. It always sounds good. We've had a really, uh, a really thought-provoking time speaking to the author of The Night War. Our guest has been Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Kimberly, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Before we invite our guests into the studio, I want to ask you, are you looking for a unique way to support diverse voices in literature? Introducing Buy YQ Book Fairs, where every page tells a story of empowerment, culture, and diversity. Buy YQ Book Fairs is a 100% women and minority-owned initiative showcasing a hand-picked selection of diverse books that celebrate inclusivity and representation. From captivating narratives to thought-provoking poetry, our curated collection has something for everyone. And hosting a Buy YQ Book Fair is a super easy and a fantastic way to raise funds for your organization or cause. So why wait? Visit buyyobq.com today to learn more about how you can bring the magic of diverse literature to your community while supporting women and minority-owned businesses. Before we invite our guests into the studio, I would love to invite you to visit a very special website. It's clownswithoutborders.org. Clownswithoutborders.org. This is a group that I absolutely adore. I am part of Clowns Without Borders, and I had the honor of being part of the 2023 tour of El Salvador. I had so much fun joining with artists from all over the world to bring a smile to people who really needed it and, and, and really appreciated it too. And we would love for you to join us as a monthly join maker. Uh, the joy makers, they're a family of people just like you who love to laugh and make other people feel good. So please take a moment and visit clownswithoutborders.org and consider joining me as a joy maker. Join us right now from the great state of Connecticut. Our guest is here to celebrate. Her brand new picture book is called Partly Cloudy. Please welcome to the show, Deborah Friedman. Hey, Deborah, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. Deborah and I were both um, commenting that both of our skies right now are completely cloudy. Yes. I was <laughs> saying that my sky is so gray, it's really not interesting at all to look at. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think um, kind of concerns me uh, is that we spend so much time looking down at our phones we don't look up at the sky very much. And, and that was an issue. There was a, a, a old uh, weatherman here in Boston, uh, even before the days of, of iPhones, he was concerned about this. And he started um, a movement just to get people to look up at the sky. I love that. I'm, you know, I'm always encouraging kids to look all around them. Mm -hmm. You know, the world all around us is so interesting. Um, and if you actually pay attention, your life can be more interesting and full of joy. I love that. The world is very interesting. And noticing it and teaching our kids to notice how interesting the world is, what a gift that is to give to our kids. Yeah, I mean, just everyday things around us. And I just, I my last few books have just, um, I've tried to dive into that a little more. Just things, you know, where did the different ha parts of my house come from? Or watching the birds in the sky. I wrote a book called Tiny Dino when I discovered that birds were dinosaurs. Um, and then, so if you not only pay close attention, but then ask questions about the things you see outside, um, I don't know. It's given me such joy to know more about these everyday things I walk by every day. You yeah. Know? yeah. I've mentioned here in the podcast, when my kids were young, um, we, we are blessed. We have a beautiful piece of property here in Boston, which is very much unlike most of Boston, that we have trees and we're next mm -hmm. to a wildlife sanctuary. And 
very often uh, my kids and I would, would lie in the hammock between these two majestic trees and just look up and imagine all of the creatures that were living in these trees. Wow. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love that you do that. So let's talk about Partly Cloudy. Okay. Yeah, so Partly Cloudy, um, you know, during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time wandering around looking at the world. I, too, live um, by a very beautiful park that I love to, um, woods that I love to walk through. And as I said at the time, I, I was working on a book about birds as dinosaurs. So I'm looking at birds a lot. So I'm looking up a lot. Um, and of I love clouds. I mean, who doesn't love clouds? They can be so beautiful. And I love it um, when, say, my daughter Lucy sends me pictures of clouds all the time or beautiful sunsets. And, um, and I also love painting clouds. Um, so I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool um, for me personally if I could just fill a whole book full of clouds and just make a whole book about clouds? Um, so that was the artist in me thinking I wanted to make this book. And then the science, science-y part of my brain said, well, you don't really know that much about clouds, so maybe you should learn something. Um, so I did. I started reading about clouds, and I came up with this story pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, I had, to, I had to learn all this science and, and try to make it clear for kids. So it's about two um, two characters who happen to be fluffy bunnies looking at clouds. One sees them as an artist might, you know, oh, that's cotton candy. Um, and the other says, no, that's a cumulus cloud. That's the science uh, scientist. Um, so it's about two different points of view, two different ways of looking at the exact same thing. Wow. I, you know, I love that. I, because in a very simple and beautiful way, you are teaching kids, reminding parents about something that it seems most of us have forgotten, that two different perspectives can exist together and can exist in harmony. And Yes. And, and, and that is something I think we've lost, and it makes me so upset. Oh, yeah, we really have. I mean that we can – two different points of view can enhance each other and we mm -hmm. can learn so much from each other. Um, and it can make life so much more fun, really, if we listen to each other. So that's, you know, that's the story of the book, these two characters. But at the same time, um, I wanted to fold very gently that science in there. So there are facts in there um, woven in throughout um, hopefully in a gentle way so that the book isn't still, you know, the story is engaging. And then in the back, I have eight full pages of factual, you know, facts, nonfiction about um, different kinds of clouds, how they form, the water cycle for kids who want to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So it's part fiction, part nonfiction, and, you know, so that I hope it'll appeal to a wide range of readers. Yeah. I, well, I I think that's so cool. And, you know, we talk about and we ask authors what kind of conversations you think you can have with your kids as you're reading a particular book. I'm just imagining this is going to inspire families to go out and find a hill and lie down on the hill and just look at the clouds and tell me what you see. Yeah, I hope so. I really, I would love that. I hope it inspires all kinds of conversations, like what we said about point of view or what's opinion, what's fact, um, what's the difference between those two things. But also, I would love, um, I even made an activity guide that I have on my website, just not that I have any, you know, um, expertise as a teacher or anything, just my thoughts about how um, you could go, you could read this book and then maybe have it inspire some writing um, or science observation experiments um, or making art because there's so much you could do with clouds, so many different ways you could show them. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I oftentimes ask authors and illustrators is, you know, what came first? And it sounds like the image and your desire to just 
draw and illustrate uh, and create these images of, of clouds came first. Am I right? Yeah, I, th I think that was the spark because I do love to paint clouds. Um, at the same time, I often tell kids that I think of myself as a writer who writes with words and pictures both. So when I'm actually working out my story, I'm doing both at the same time. I'm doodling, I'm writing, I'm doodling, I'm, I'm writing, and I'm, you know, um, working the story out in a thumbnail size sketch. Wow. So, so do you actually have a pad of paper next to the computer as you're typing the words or you're writing the words out longhand? I start out um, in a, in a little tiny sketchbook writing little words. And then sometimes, yeah, I do get over to the computer, but I really have to have those images in my head, even if I'm just working on the words, because my word counts in my books are pretty low mm -hmm. because I'm telling so much of the story through the pictures. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. one of the things that you mentioned um, is that this idea came to you uh, as you were writing about birds and discovering that birds were dinosaurs or dis descendants of dinosaurs. That's still blowing me away. I have to be honest with you. I, you know, I've, I've heard the science and all that, and, and okay, it kind of makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to me. The dinosaur thing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I when I was a kid, we didn't, we never learned that. I mean, if you talk to kids now who know a lot about dinosaurs, who are really into them, they know that birds are dinosaurs. But it, I saw, I stumbled on, I was researching something else and stumbled on an article in Scientific American about how birds were dinosaurs, and it blew my mind. Um, and then I, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I have to write about this. Yeah. I have to make a story about this. Yeah. I remember the first time um, uh, a, a dear friend of mine uh, who's very intelligent, but, you know, she shares these things that are just out there. She was the first per person that brought this to me, and I'm like, oh, okay, there she goes again. She's, like, out of her mind. That, that, there's no way, but it's a way. It's, you know. Well, you're like the, cre the other creatures in my book. My book is about a hummingbird trying to convince all these other creatures that they are indeed a dinosaur um, and goes through, you know, proving how uh -huh. um, they're a dinosaur. So. Wow. This is <laughs> great. I, you know. It must be so much fun for you to kind of, uh, or, or is it fun for you when when you're creating these stories and the in the illustrations? Uh, are, are you just sitting there, kind of giggling like a kid playing their their favorite game, or is it arduous and really difficult for you to bring these things to life? Well, it's both. I mean, there are definitely times when I'm tearing my hair out because I revise so much. I mean, it takes me such a long time to write a book. But at the same time, I can, oh, for sure, be sitting there making myself laugh. Um, and then I, I'm kind of like, well, I made myself laugh, but will I make other people laugh? I have no idea till I show my work to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always curious because I've been doing educational magic shows for 35 years. And oh, cool. when I'm out there and I'm trying to make people laugh and, and I'm, I'm coming up with an idea, maybe it's a new joke that I wrote or it's just something that popped into my head. I know instantaneously whether or not it's funny. and Whether it's landed or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and even, you know, and that's a lot of fun. Even when the jokes don't land. And I'm kind of out there because we can react to that, and and that's fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, is it? Have you gotten to the point where it's you're like, okay, um, it's going to take me two years to find out if this is funny for kids, um, right? And, and uh, that's okay, I, I can wait. <laughs> well, I do. Um, I mean, I ha I work with an agent and editor, a whole editorial team, so I do have that kind of feedback. But you're right in terms of children. I don't know, um, you know, I, I did finish Partly Cloudy a pretty long, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, and it's just now, I, I'm just now getting out into the world with it, you know, the last couple of weeks, and I have to say that when kids laugh, when I want them to laugh, it is so gratifying, but you're right, you don't know. Um, I do have now some experience visiting schools with other books and just with presenting to children. So I've 
um, learned a lot over the years about what resonates and what doesn't. And of course, it depends on their ages. You mm -hmm. know, I'm talking to anywhere from two on up. Mm -hmm. So um, every group is different, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of authors and aspiring authors and authors who are aspiring to get out and do classroom visits and school visits. What advice would you give to them in terms of them as, a, as they're creating in their mind the, their school presentation? What do you think makes for a really engaging school presentation? Well, it's tricky, but um, because you want it to be engaging, but you don't want to just have total chaos. Do you know what I mean? So my my own visits tend to be, you know, pretty calm and just trying to draw them in in an emotional way. I, I as an illustrator, I can draw and kids love that. Um, and, you know, as I said, if I can make it a little bit interactive, I was with some friends last night who were talking about interactive things that they do, whether it's singing a song or the kids are getting fidgety halfway through and they do some kind of get your fidgets out kind of thing. Um, but I, I tell it, I, I begin by relating to them as, a, you know, as when I was a child, um, what I like to do as a child, and so that you immediately sort of draw them in. And I draw them in um, with drawing and emotional content before I get into the sort of curricular things that I know the teachers want me to cover. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I, you, you shared with us that you did a lot of research into clouds and the science of clouds. What mm -hmm. was the thing, the most surprising thing that you learned about clouds? Most surprising? Well, I learned about how you can predict the weather by understanding clouds. Um, Clouds can tell you so much about air currents and whether it's going to rain in a couple of days. Um, it's just it's just fascinating. Um, and just I just I think I you know I vague we all vaguely know about clouds and the main kinds of clouds and all, but I didn't you know just learning exactly how they formed mm -hmm. um, and exactly what makes it rain or hail is really interesting too. Um, and I learned about um, contrails, aircraft condensation trails, um, and how they're really not good for the planet. I didn't get into that too much except for a little sidebar in the book, but they're not great for the planet because they trap warm air. Um, they can turn into cirrus clouds and trap warm air. So that was a unappealing fact that was a surprise that I learned mm, mm, yeah yeah I th you know I think that this is um, it would be really fun to use your book to kind of uh, get kids curious about the world but also get them curious about the stem fields mm -hmm. and you know just like hey there's yes there's this thing but um, Let's let's dive deeper into it. Let's find out more about that thing. Well, that that's what I hope, and that's kind of me, actually. I was never – I liked science and math. I was pretty good at it, but I, I, wasn't, I wouldn't think of myself as a STEM kid. I was always the class artist, mm -hmm. you know. So um, – but just being around other writers who write nonfiction and, and knowing about their process and everything, talking to them about research – um, just it has been so inspiring. And and then I discovered, like, there's so many ideas all around me if I just, you know, as I said earlier, pay attention and learn about them. Yeah. That was something um, that Jane Yolen, uh, author who's written over 400 books when she was on the podcast, said is that there are ideas everywhere you go. There are yes. ideas for stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And bringing the science into it just has added a whole other layer to it. I think it's just for me, um, I've just enjoyed learning about these different things. What is it? So, so you acknowledge that there's stories all around you. How do you decide which stories to work on and turn into books? Well, it's a little tricky. Sometimes it's a sort of mysterious thing. You know, I keep notebooks full of ideas. I tell kids I'm an idea collector. Um, and it could be the tiniest little dumb thing, like I 
liked the words tiny dino. I wrote them down. It wasn't for a few more years till I read that article about dinosaurs and birds. And then, but then once you have like a couple ideas or thoughts collide together, then it feels like it could be a book. Yeah. I think it's not usually just one idea. I think it's usually at least two or more ideas kind of colliding. Oh. And then it kind of, kind of goes, boom, I think that could be a book. Wow. So it's kind of like making uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Just go, yeah, you can have spaghetti. You can have meatballs, but it's not spaghetti and meatballs, you know? <laughs> I love this. I love this. What advice, if, they're, 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 uh, if there's a parent out there that has a kid who loves to draw, maybe loves to write, what advice would you give that parent to encourage their kids to, you know, kind of go for it? Well, just, I, you know, I raise kids and I just have supplies at home. And all, although I encourage kids to recycle, you can write on anything. And you know, I said I keep notebooks, but I also tell kids I write on any little scrap of paper. I never go anywhere without paper and something to write with. Um, and then I just put them all together with a paper clip. So I have a collection of, uh, of ideas. Uh -huh. um, so I collect ideas. Um, then I go home and I, 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 um, I watch animals closely, um, pay attention to how they move and all. So then when I come home, I'm at my desk, I've been in the world. Um, I just let it, all that information sort of inspire me to draw or write. Um, and some kids start with drawing, some kids start with writing, but either one can be a way into the other, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you ever get one of those pieces of paper in your pocket and you pull it out and you read it and you go, what in the world was I thinking? Uh, that happens to me all the time, actually. <laughs> I even keep a pad um, next to the bed and a pencil. And um, and so it's most often the things I write in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning and I think, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I sometimes will send myself a message on my phone. And, of course, it's auto-correcting and everything. And I wake up oh, in the morning yeah. and I'm like, when did I learn how to speak Russian? I <laughs> Yes. Hey, Deborah, where can people go to find out more about Partly Cloudy, Tiny Dinos, and all the wonderful ideas that are coming from your mind? They can go to my website, which is www.deborahfriedman.net, um, and I have information about my books. I have resources for parents and teachers, um, those activity guides that I made without any curricular knowledge or anything, just my thoughts, you know, how to be creative with these books, um, you know, uh, science experiments, uh, coloring sheets, all kinds of things. Um, so I have all kinds of resources on my website, and I hope you'll visit them. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author and illustrator of Partly Cloudy, Jessica Deborah Friedman. Deborah, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reading With Your Kids and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. We would love for you to also follow us and connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash readingwithyourkids, at readingwithyourkids on Instagram and TikTok, and at Gently Magic on Twitter. We have a great YouTube channel where you can find our Drawing With Your Kids videos and also our STEM is Family Fun videos, and you can also... Listen to the show on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash reading with your kids. Hey, if you're listening to us on the WREB AMF 24-7 radio network and you miss any of the show or you just find something so fascinating you want to listen to it again, you can check out the show on our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can also find every episode of the show at your favorite podcasting app, uh, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Good Pods, wherever you find your favorite shows. Hey, if you're an author, please be sure to visit readingwithyourkids.com and click on the Authors Click Here button up at the top of the page to find out how you can be a guest on Reading With Your Kids. You'll also be able to find out about our amazing promotional programs. I, I want to suggest to everybody, please 
please be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your favorite shows. Uh, we just returned from the International Children's Book Fair in Bologna, Italy. What an amazing event. event. Over 1,500 publishers uh, at this event from all over the world. We met some amazing uh, publishers and individuals, and we're going to be sharing those conversations with you over the next few weeks. So we're real excited about that. So please, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a second. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. We're going to start by thanking our guests, Deborah Freeman and Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. I also want to thank my team, Fata Makan, Rory Brady, Chris Darty, Skylar Strauss, Nick Warner, Kyoko Ito. Kaylin Newland, Kristen Barrett, Sydney Swan, Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. I think you are amazing and beautiful. You take the time to listen to the show, but more importantly, you take the time to read with your kids. And that makes the world a better place. Hey, I'll be looking for you in the next episode of Reading with Your Kids. 